followed a plant-based ketogenic diet. And I'm very diligent with numbers and using the various softwares to figure out what's going on. And so I can now, with all the knowledge I have now, I can sort of historically look at data and figure out, okay, when I followed that plant-based ketogenic diet, I ate, call it about um, 70 grams of total carbohydrate per day, which if you take out the fiber and you take out fructose, you end up with about 30 grams of glucose, okay? 30 grams of glucose per day. So if I needed, let's say roughly, um, you know, 30 units of insulin to metabolize the 30 grams of glucose over the course of 24 hours, that's a one to one ratio, okay? And then, so now I transition to this low fat plant-based whole food diet and I'm eating well over 700 grams of carbohydrate per day. And a good amount of that is fiber and a good amount is fructose as well. So we now have software that you, such as Chronometer where you can remove those and just figure out how much glucose am I consuming, okay? And then, so I, I did the math and my ratio now of on average, I can I inject one unit of insulin to consume 10 grams of glucose. That is a 900% change in insulin sensitivity. And so like Cyrus was saying with this superpower and this data we have, people with type one diabetes in particular have an amazing amount of data on a meal by meal basis. We test our blood glucose so we have the glucose numbers. We count the carbohydrate we're consuming so we know how much insulin to inject. And we know and can quantify how much insulin are we using? Whereas if you're not living with type one, even if you have type two or you know, non, non insulin dependent type two or prediabetes, you don't know how much insulin your pancreas is secreting. So you could make the argument that, oh, maybe I saw an insulin spike and that's why my blood glucose stayed steady. But with type one, we have this, this data. I have, a C, you know, I have a C peptide test to show that I'm producing pretty much zero insulin, an undetectable amount. My C peptide is less than 0 0.1. So, or 0 0.01. Um, so we can see with these CGMs, with the insulin, with the carbohydrate we're consuming, what lifestyle choices make you more insulin sensitive and more insulin resistant. And, and the data is, it's, it's shockingly consistent. I, I mean, I think in, in the world of science and, and biology, sometimes it's hard to say something is always like 100% certain. But when it comes to eating a low-fat plant-based whole food diet, reducing your dietary fat intake, and following the mastering diabetes method and employing these principles, I have yet to see somebody who did not become more insulin sensitive. I have yet to run to that person. The thousands of people have been through our coaching program who didn't see that insulin works more efficiently when you reduce your dietary fat intake. And that all comes back to, you know, CGMs. And we're seeing that consistently with our clients and, and Cyrus wants to add something. So please go ahead. Yeah. So everything that Robbie's saying is perfectly uh, accurate. So let's, let's play a game here just to make sure that you know, we're all on the same page. So imagine you're living in a non-diabetic state and you would know that because you got your A1C tested recently and it tested at a 5.3%. Your fasting glucose is 75 or 85, okay? It's well within the normal range. So you're considered non-diabetic by all measures um, that given to you by a doctor. Now, fast forward two years and your A1C instead of being 5.3% is now 5.9%. And your fasting glucose, instead of being 85, is now 103. Okay, so what you're doing is you're entering into the prediabetes range. You find that when you eat food, when you look at your CGM, now your post-meal blood glucose values go as high as 130 to 140. Okay? If you were following the standard conventional wisdom that you had presented earlier, which is that your blood glucose should never go over 120, which is what a lot of these CGM companies are now saying for non-diabetic individuals. If you're following that information, then what you would do is you would say, oh, well, I think I'm eating too many carbs because I know that carbs or carbohydrate is actually what's elevating my blood glucose. So what you would do is you would limit your carbohydrate intake. You'd, you'd reduce the amount of fruits and potatoes and legumes and whole grains in your diet. And then you would substitute that with either foods that are higher in protein or foods that are higher in fat. Those are your only two options, right? So you would limit your carbohydrate intake while eating slightly more protein and or slightly more fat. And over the course of time, you would naturally gravitate towards a more, we'll call it, you know, a lower carbohydrate diet, whether it was a paleo diet or a ketogenic diet, who cares? But the idea is that you'd be lowering your carbohydrate intake, right? 
So when people do that, in the short term, what they'll find is that when they limit their carbohydrate intake, well, guess what? Their fasting glucose went down, their A1C is likely to go down over the course of the next few months, and their post-meal blood glucose is no longer 130 to 140. Their post-meal blood glucose is now 106. So in the short term, you would start eating more protein and fat-rich foods, and you take a look at your CGM, you'd be like, hey, things are moving in the right direction. I'm clearly solving the problem. Things are, you know, I'm becoming more non-diabetic, at least on paper. But what the research actually demonstrates is the opposite, is that if you were to increase your protein and or fat consumption at the expense of carbohydrate, in other words, if you were to play the carbohydrate avoidance game, which is the way we like to refer to it, then you'll get better short-term results. You'll get improved glycemic responses when you eat, uh, when you eat food. But then in addition to that, uh, you are also likely to lose a little bit of weight because this is generally what happens when people eat low carbohydrate diets. And that unto itself is gonna improve your glucose even more. So it's this kind of feed forward cycle. But here's the problem. The evidence-based research also demonstrates that people who eat more protein and or more fat, especially people who are eating more animal-based protein and or animal-based fat, actually end up with a higher incidence of chronic disease. They end up with more cardiovascular disease, more mortality from cardiovascular disease. They end up with a higher risk for diabetes, a higher risk for mortality from diabetes, and they end up with a higher all-cause mortality, okay? Premature death from any cause. And I'm talking about eating more protein and more fat-rich foods over the course of time. Not in the first six months, but over the course of two to five to seven to 12 to 16 years, right? That's what the epidemiological research shows. So if you follow this methodology that my glucose should never go over 120 because that's what the CGM company told me, then you're likely to gravitate towards a lifestyle that's actually gonna worsen your health over the course of time. But if instead you recognize that the reason that your post-meal blood glucose is increasing and the reason your A1C and your fasting glucose is increasing is not because you're eating too many carbohydrates, likely. It's because you have become less carbohydrate tolerant, AKA because you have become more insulin resistant. So now we have to figure out what causes that. We gotta back up one step and say, what is causing a reduced ability to metabolize carbohydrate? And then you gotta solve that problem. Again, you look in the research, what causes a reduced ability to metabolize carbohydrate? The answer is increased dietary fat. So when you consume, that, that's, the, that's the number one culprit, okay? The most repeatable culprit is increased saturated fat intake. And then you also have other ancillary variables, including uh, number two, less activity, so a more sedentary lifestyle. Then you also have things like alcohol can cause it. You can have overconsumption of calories that can cause it. Weight gain can cause it. So there's a whole bunch of variables, but the, the predominant variable, the one that's the most powerful is the fact that you're consuming an excess quantity of saturated fat. So the very thing that is reducing your carbohydrate tolerance in the first place is the thing that most people gravitate towards when they see a higher blood glucose value. And that's the problem with this information that so many, that, that's circulated in the general public that says, if your blood glucose is greater than 115 or 120 after a meal, then reduce your carbohydrate intake. It unfortunately leads to more uh, chronic disease, even though the results may appear to be better in the short term.